Hey, uh, good evening. Our Wednesday evening services in the month of August are centered on the teachings are dinners with Jesus. Is this the first one of the month? No, it isn't. It's the second one of the month. All right. Third. Is it the third one of the month already? No, it's only the 10th. All right. Stop doing that to me. Um, So tonight, we're going to take a look at this wonderful meal with Jesus, the feeding of the 5,000. Please open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. We're going to take a look starting at verse 10. Luke, chapter 9, starting at verse 10. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. The apostles were sent out by Jesus in Luke chapter 9, verse 1. They were commissioned to go across the cities and the villages of the region of Galilee and do what Jesus was doing, announce the coming of God's kingdom, proclaim the message of what the kingdom of God was like, bring forth that message from the apostles, essentially extending the work of Jesus beyond what he could individually do. This was sort of the first preaching mission that the apostles went out on. And I can imagine that when they came back after that preaching mission, that they were exhilarated and exhausted. And they came back and Jesus could sense something of this in them. And so what did he say? He said, hey, let's go aside to a deserted place. Let's take a break, guys. Staff retreat. We're going to get away. And I love how it says it there in verse 10. It says, um, and they told him all that they had done. Can you just see the apostles just bubbling forth? Jesus, we did this and this and this and this happened good and this happened bad and they're just pouring it out. Jesus says, guys, staff retreat. Let's get away to a deserted place. But you know, sometimes when you plan something like that, it doesn't always turn out the way you thought it might. That's when we come to verse 11. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. Well, some staff retreat, that turned out to be. You see, instead, a needy multitude comes to Jesus and the apostles, and Jesus says, guys, I know we had this staff retreat plan. We'll get to it later. I'll find a way to encourage you and refresh you. But you know what? There's a multitude that is needy. It says right there, When the multitudes knew it, they followed him. And instead of rejecting those needy people, did you see what it said there in verse 11? It says, he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he healed them. Jesus had a wonderful attitude in that he received the people. He didn't run from the crowd He didn't tell them to go away, but with love and with service, he said, I'm going to receive you and pour into you. Now, Jesus of Nazareth was the most unique person who has ever walked this earth because he was fully God and fully man. Or maybe a better way to state it is truly God and truly man. And in a way that's sort of beyond our ability to explain, his divine nature and his human nature existed together in one person. Jesus was not a man with a split personality. And and neither nature canceled out the other. But what I want you to understand by saying that is that the divine nature of Jesus did not cancel out his human nature. He was human. He felt the things that humans feel. He became hungry. Did you know that God in heaven never becomes hungry? Jesus became hungry. 
Well, why? Because he stopped being God? No, but because he had a real human nature. He became tired. He became thirsty. And there was something in the way that Jesus served and ministered to other people that took something out of him. Do you remember when the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment did that? Jesus said something very curious. It said there that he knew that virtue had gone out of him. What I'm just trying to say is that when Jesus gave himself in service to the multitude, it wore him out. He was expending something from himself, but he did it. Again, verse 11, he received them. Verse 11 also says that he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. That was his teaching. That this was the emphasis in the work of Jesus to preach and to proclaim this is what the kingdom of God was all about, especially because there were so many misunderstandings in that culture about what the kingdom of God was all about. And then it says that he healed those who had need of healing. Jesus did not give them only spiritual instruction, but he also did good among them with what we might call a supernatural empowering. Now, I would like to add something here to the Luke account from Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. Just this one line from Matthew 14, 14, where it says that he was moved with compassion for them. What a beautiful thing, isn't it? Jesus looking at the crowd, looking at this message that, that would cost him something to minister to, yet he loved them. He was moved with compassion for the crowd. Now verse 12, Luke chapter 9. When the day began to wear away, the 12 came and said to him, send the multitude away that, we may, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions for in a, we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. After the long day, don't you like that phrasing there? I, I like it in the translation I'm using here, the New King James Version in verse 12 where it says, when the day began to wear away. It was getting later in the day. They're tired. The disciples now began to see the crowds as a bother. Jesus, send them away. The needs of this crowd are inexhaustible. We'll never be able to meet all their needs. Just send them away. Tomorrow's a new day. We'll hit it again hard tomorrow. We're done for the day, aren't we, Jesus? Now, I don't know if it's entirely fair for us to criticize the disciples for this. You know, preachers like we, me, we kind of make a living off of bagging on the disciples, don't we? Oh, look at how bad they are. Look at how unspiritual. They give us lots of reasons to do that kind of thing. I, I just kind of imagine. What, can I pause right here? Do you guys know what's going to happen in this story? Yeah, we, we kind of know the end of it, don't we? Can I just remind you something? The disciples didn't know the end of this story. If you were there in the sandals of the disciples, could you possibly conceive that Jesus would feed that group of 5,000 men, which had to be many thousands more, counting women and children? Could you conceive that Jesus would feed that vast multitude with five loaves and a few fish? Would it even enter into your mind? I, I doubt it. I, I don't know if the disciples were being so much selfish as they were just saying, well, what else can we do? We really haven't experienced this with you, Jesus, before where you feed a multitude miraculously. That hasn't been checked off on our list yet. 
And so maybe it's just a failure of imagination. They probably felt that they were doing something good for the multitude. Hey, let's let them go out and buy some food for themselves. We're doing them a favor, Jesus. We're not hurting them. But in verse 13, Jesus said something radical. He said, you give them something to eat. Can you imagine how the disciples looked at one another when Jesus said that? They they probably laughed a little bit. (laughs) What are you talking about? That must have sounded like a strange or even shocking request. It was obvious to them that they had nowhere near the resources. They didn't have enough combined food among themselves to feed themselves, much less the multitude. With that statement, Jesus challenged their faith And he challenged their compassion. Now, again, I I, want to emphasize that it probably wouldn't even enter the mind of the disciples, even in the smallest way, that God might provide for this multitude with a miracle. And they probably could have made a lot of excuses, legitimate excuses for why this couldn't happen. (laughs) Jesus, look, for us to feed the multitude, this isn't the right place. This isn't the right time. The people can take care of themselves. And let me tell you something, these were people, and we know this not because we know them personally, of course, but we just know what life was like at least somewhat back those centuries ago. These were people who knew what it was to skip a meal. You look at me and you say, David, I don't think you know what it is to skip a meal very often. But, but these were people who knew what it was. They were experienced in this. I mean, it was just like for, for them to skip a meal or two, it was not going to be a crisis. Jesus, I just don't see how or even what the urgent need is to do this. Now, let me throw in something here from John chapter 6, verse 6, where it says this. He said this to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. That's why Jesus asked the question. Guys, I got a test for you. I know what I'm going to do here. You don't know what I'm going to do, but I know perfectly well exactly what I'm going to do. I want you to understand that for Jesus, this wasn't just about getting a job done, so to speak. It was about growing his disciples in faith, teaching them how to have a compassion that would trust God to do miraculous things. I'll throw in something else from the Gospel of John, or you could even quote it from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 37, where we are told that 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient. I mean, we know in the Luke account that they said, we don't have the resources to do it, but, but the other Gospels fill in the account just how much they estimated. They did a quick calculation. They looked at the many thousands of people all over. They go, how much would it take to give everybody here, just a little bit of food, it would take 200 denarii, which was well more than half a year's wages for a working man. Now, you know, I'm sure the disciples would say, Jesus, if we had that kind of money, we wouldn't waste it on a single lunch for this multitude. I mean, look, let's talk serious here. Let's talk good financial planning. Not that I'm an expert. But I would just say this, wouldn't you? That if you had 200 denarii, isn't it kind of a waste to blow it all on one extravagant lunch for everybody? You say, what? Okay, even if we had that money, Jesus, it's not worth it to put it into this And I love that Jesus' attitude, not his words, but his attitude is something that's good. Man, you have no idea the resources that I have. The the disciples are kind of thinking along these lines. Jesus, if we had that kind of money, we'd never spend it on one meal for this crowd. They annoy us, and they're going to be hungry again a few hours later. Shouldn't we spend that money on something else? But Jesus said, guys, I've got ways to provide that you have no way of knowing. And Jesus said this to test his disciples. 
And I, I kind of think, let's pretend what the perfect faith-filled response from the disciples would have been. Let's play let's pretend, okay? Here it is, the perfect response from the disciples. Master, I don't know where the food is to feed this crowd, but you are greater than Moses, whom God used to feed a multitude in the wilderness every day for 40 years. And God can certainly do a lesser work through a greater servant. Jesus, we know that you're greater than Elijah, whom God used to feed the many sons of the prophets through little food. And Jesus, what is more, the scriptures say that man shall not live by bread alone, and you are great enough to fill this multitude from the words of your mouth. That would have been awesome if the disciples would have said something like that. But that's purely from the realm of let's pretend. Jesus said, we're going to provide something for this multitude. The people are hungry. I will provide for them. Now, allow me just for a moment to make an analogy to the spiritual need of people right here, right now. Not only the people in this room, but I mean everybody in our community. I mean everybody in our state, everybody in our country, everybody across the world. People are hungry. They need spiritual nourishment. Whether they recognize it or not, they need it. And friends, people are hungry and the atheists and the skeptics try to convince them that they're not hungry at all. People are hungry, and empty religion offers them some ceremonies or some rituals that can never satisfy. People are hungry, and religious showmen give them smoke and lights and grand productions. People are hungry and entertainers give them loud, fast action. So loud and so fast that they don't even have a moment to think. People are hungry, but only Jesus has the bread of life. And this is what he wants to give to the people. So what does he do? Well, Matthew chapter 14 uh, verse, not Matthew 14, we're back in, excuse me, Luke chapter 9, uh, it says, verse 14, uh, for there were about 5,000 men, he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. Now, have you ever thought, how did they know there were 5,000 men here? Pretty easy when you break everybody down into groups of 50, isn't it? Jesus, he's pretty smart. Guys, we need to get a pretty good count of this, so break them down into groups of 50. So you could just imagine the disciples doing this organizing work. Okay, we need about 50 here, about 50 there. It gets everybody to sit down. Now verses 16 and 17. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish. Now, you know from the Gospel of John, it tells us where the five loaves and the two fish came from. Do, do you remember? came from a little boy. There's a Bible commentator that I love to read. I, I read him all the time. He, he only writes commentaries on the New Testament. His name is William Barclay. Barclay's great. Wonderful insight into ancient history, history from Bible times. Great insight into Greek words. But sometimes I want to take my William Barclay commentary and throw it across the room. Because William Barclay under the influence of, what would you call it? Um, liberal Christianity of the early 20th century. That was the environment that he came from. He was fundamentally an anti-supernaturalist. And what this meant was, he had this inescapable reflex where he always wanted to explain away a miracle in the Bible. So it's just... It, Anything he could reach for to say, you know, it, it's not a miracle, he would explain it that way. So you know how he explains the feeding of the 5,000? This is so bad, it's good. 
That's why I'm sharing it with you. William Barclay said this, it wasn't a miracle of food being multiplied. It was a miracle of sharing. Because when the multitude saw this little boy give up his lunch, they actually had tons of food socked away in picnic baskets and whatever. And when they saw this little boy sharing, they said, you know, we're so moved. We should share with everybody. And it was a miracle of sharing. Mr. Barkley, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> I'll take your good, but you're wrong on that one. There's something amazing that happened with these five loaves and two fish. It says right in verse 16. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. You know, it's easy to think that five loaves and two fish is a worthless contribution to the hunger need of a group of 10,000, 12,000 people, because it was 5,000 men, not counting women and children. You're talking about a huge group. But Jesus took those five loaves and two fish, and he looked up to heaven, and he blessed and broke them. All right, I need to have some real talk here about when we pray over our food. The biblical pattern... Now, you could pray over your food any way you want. I, I'm not telling you how to pray. I'm just telling you what the Bible means when it means about praying over the food. When Jesus says he blessed, it doesn't mean that he blessed the food. That's usually how we pray, isn't it? Now, again, God forbid I'd say, oh, that's a wrong prayer. You're in the penalty box for praying like that. I just want you to know, that the biblical idea isn't to ask God to bless the food, it's to thank God that he has blessed you with food. That's really the idea. To bless God is to thank him. Jesus is blessing and thanking the Lord for the food that they have in front of him. Thank you, Lord, for this food. He's blessing. He's honoring. He's blessing God for the food, and then he's breaking it. Even though it wasn't much, Jesus blessed his God and Father for the food that he did have. And he might have even prayed a familiar Jewish prayer before a meal. I mean, this was a familiar prayer. It wasn't a universal prayer, but it was something like this. Blessed art thou, Jehovah our God, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Thank you, Lord, for this food. And what did he do? He blessed, he broke them, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Okay, now, you ask yourself the question. How did this miracle actually work? Well, the only way I can suggest, and let's be honest, the text doesn't tell us exactly, but I'll just tell you what makes sense to me, is that the miracle happened in the hands of Jesus, not in the hands of the disciples. So Jesus had a piece of bread in his hand. He tore off a piece and gave it to a disciple. Tore, tore, tore. And for some reason, the, the piece of bread that never really seemed to get smaller. He just kept tearing pieces off of it. And I wonder, if there were five loaves, you know, did Jesus tear off about a thousand pieces? And that, Well, that loaf's done. Let me go to the next loaf. I don't know. I don't know how much he got out of each loaf. But he, he just kept tearing it off. It seems that the miracle happened in the hands of Jesus and the disciples simply distributed it. And that's a little bit of a pattern for us, right? We can't work any miracles. Good heavens, not. But what we can do is take Jesus' mighty power and maybe just be a conduit for it, distribute what Jesus has done and wants to do for people. 
He just kept providing. A remarkable miracle could happen. And listen, I, I know, I, I understand that, that someone who's skeptical of the things in the Bible would look at this and just say, come on. I, I, I really only have one answer to that. The one cross-reference I would make for the validity of a miracle like this happening is Genesis 1.1. Does anybody know Genesis 1.1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that, you can believe this. The same God who has the creative power to create the universe can create bread after bread after bread, tearing it off. That creative power, that creative genius is in his hands. He can do it. Now look, honestly, if you don't believe Genesis 1-1, then I understand how the rest of it's really hard for you to accept. Okay, I get that. But for those of us who do believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, then that same creator God that, that, that the Bible tells us that Jesus, it was through him that everything that was created is created, that that creative power of God is within the hands of the Savior. And he could simply do a remarkable creative miracle at that time and at that place. And I love the phrasing there in verse 17. It says, so they all ate and were filled. Jesus miraculously multiplied the loaves and the fishes until far more than 5,000 were fed. And they weren't fed with just a little snack or appetizer. They ate until they were filled. Now something else to understand about the ancient world. You know, we live in such comparative abundance that it's hard for us to understand that it was a special treat in the ancient world to sit down at a meal that you could eat as much as you possibly wanted. That, that's almost what the definition of a feast was. A feast was where you could sit down and, oh, can you believe it? I can eat until I don't want to eat anymore, until I'm completely filled. Matter of fact, I love how it states it in John chapter 6, verse 11. In John 6, 11, it says that they all ate as much as they wanted. And that was a remarkable thing. That was a special treat for them. And you know what I think about in this regard? If everyone ate as much as they wanted, that also included that little boy who gave up his five loaves and uh, two fish. He, he was not forgotten. He didn't come out the loser. He got plenty of lunch for himself as well, as much as he possibly wanted. Now, let's pretend that somebody walked away from this occasion hungry. Why? Why would they walk away hungry? Well, it was because either they refused the bread from Jesus or the apostles didn't distribute the bread to everyone. Those are the only two reasons I can figure out. They said, no, I don't want it. Or for some reason, some logistical mix-up, the disciples failed in distributing it. The point is, is that Jesus supplied plenty for everyone. And friends, Jesus can supply enough that we need. He is a God who provides. I, I got a book a long time ago that sort of analyzed and categorized artwork on the catacombs of Rome because Christians would paint on the walls of those catacombs. And what was very interesting is a very familiar motif on the catacombs of Rome were the loaves and the fishes of the feeding of the 5,000. They understood, they remembered, Jesus feeds us the bread of life, all that we need again and again and again. 
Jesus does tremendous things. I would say that the feeding of the 5,000 gives us at least three principles about the way God provides. Number one, we should always thank God for and wisely use what you have. Don't you think it's amazing that when Jesus fed this multitude, he started with what he had. Secondly, we need to trust that God has unlimited resources. Look, our resources are limited. Of course they are, but God's resources are unlimited. And number three, this is very important, never waste what God gives you. Did you see that they went around and picked up the fragments? That would have been a pretty easy day to leave all that stuff behind. Just to say, well, forget it. We don't need it. We've got Jesus. He can create bread anytime. She said, no, I want you to pick it up. Never waste what God provides. And Jesus did this remarkable miracle. Uh, Matthew chapter 14, verse 21 says that those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. A huge crowd. Now, before we leave this story, I want to remind you of how prominent it is. This is one of the rare miracles of Jesus that appears in all four Gospels. This shows that both the Holy Spirit and the early church thought that this story was important. And it was very important, not only as an example of the miraculous power of Jesus, but even more than being an example of the miraculous power of Jesus. So let me give you four things that this story shows us. And I'll conclude with this. Number one, this shows us that Jesus could feed the people of God even as Israel was fed in the wilderness. There was a very common expectation in those days that the Messiah would restore the provision of manna. Now, did Jesus restore the provision of manna? No. But he showed by this, yeah, I could if I wanted to. This added to the messianic credentials of Jesus. I am the one who can feed the people of God. That's number one what it shows. Number two, it shows that Jesus had real compassion and care for the people of God even when we might have expected that his patience would be exhausted. Again, I can't get over what a beautiful thing that is because in some ways, this miracle to me seems so extravagant and wasteful. I can't get the idea out of my mind that four hours later, six hours later, these people are hungry all over again. Jesus, what did you give them? You gave them four hours or six hours of a full stomach. It doesn't seem like much in the grand scheme of things. But you said, no, I love them. I showed them the love of my Father in heaven. And that, that is something that can never be taken away. So number two, it shows that Jesus had compassion and care for the people. Number three, it showed that Jesus chose to work through the hands of the disciples even when it was not essential to the immediate result. Jesus could have chosen several different ways to distribute that bread and those fish, but he decided, no, I'm going to do it through the hands of my disciples because I want to use my willing people to do their work. And then finally, this is a tremendous preview of what sometimes is called the great messianic banquet that the Messiah will enjoy with his people. You, you can't read this account of the feeding of the 5,000 without saying, man, that would have been pretty cool to be there. Well, in a sense, you are going to be there. You are going to sit down with Jesus the Messiah and all of God's people together in an orderly, organized, glorious way, and we will have a wonderful messianic banquet in heaven, enjoying 
every good thing that God has given to his people. He says, I have this for you. Friends, we need Jesus Christ, the bread of life, and he offers himself to us in just this form if we will take him and receive him. That's what we should do right now. Let me pray towards that end. Father in heaven, Lord, sometimes I'm so impressed with how charming, how captivating the life and the work of Jesus is. There's something so beautiful about it. And so, Lord, we look at the beauty of your compassion for the people. We look at the beauty of your creative power. We look at the beauty of the way that you use the disciples. We look at the beauty of what this speaks of in the future that you will grant to your people. And, Lord, we just say that we want to receive. We want to receive what you only can give to us, and that is the bread of life. We put our trust in you, Jesus. For just as much as you broke that bread and distributed it, so your own body was broken at the cross. And as you were lifted up, you exalted yourself before the world as the Savior of the world. So we trust in you, Jesus, the bread of life. And we receive from you here this evening, thanking you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen.